love to get started. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for being here. I'm Gabriella, and I'm on the Insight Seminars team as the Social Media and Youth Program Coordinator. And today I'm happy to be introducing Marianne Somerville and Mike Connor. They're going to be talking about intuition and inspiration, which is such a huge, huge topic, I think, especially oh, right now for all of us. Um, Marianne and Mike have both been involved in the site for a long, long time. I'm hearing someone, so if you could mute yourself, that would be awesome. Um, both been involved with Insight for years and years and years as facilitators. Um, they both are consultants and coaches on their own. Marianne has been amazing in designing a master's class for Insight, which is such a beautiful course. Mike has been involved with Bulgaria a lot, which is amazing. We love our global community. And both of them have been so supportive throughout this entire uh, transformation, I would say, of this work onto the online format. So thank you guys so much for being here and take it away. Thank you, Gabriella, so much. Um, just to remind everybody who just got online, today Mike and I are gonna have a conversation. And as we have the conversation, it will be us sharing what we know from our own experience about intuition and inspiration and also some of the gifts that Insight has given us in terms of expanding that. We'll be kind of interviewing each other. So we'll be asking each other questions. And we're also going to invite you to ask us questions. And for me, when people ask me a question, I realize that I have a different perspective than when I just think about it for myself. So it's a very valuable thing. And you can put those questions in the chat. Mike and I had a a little conversation before today and we decided we would start this event with one of the tools that is in insight which is a visualization of the light of the heart and for both of us um mike i'm speaking for you because we talked about it but for both of us we find that when we can connect with our hearts and the light which is a symbol for the universal consciousness that that is one of the simple ways to open our intuition, access our inspiration. So if all of you would just make yourself comfortable in your chairs, and we're gonna ask you to close your eyes briefly, it'll be about three minutes long, and just enjoy the opportunity to come with us into the beautiful heart center that we all have. So everyone just close your eyes. Take in a deep breath, and as you release that breath, just let go of any tension that you might be experiencing. Take in another deep breath, and allow yourself to imagine that you can come present into your heart, into the center of your chest, which is the heart center. It's slightly different than the physical heart. And now imagine that there's a beautiful diamond white light above your head and it's streaming down. And as it streams down, it washes all the way through you and it settles right into your heart center. And if it will help you, you can even place your hands on your heart so you connect with the warmth of that experience. And as you breathe in and out, Imagine that this radiant light increases. You might even feel a warmth through your body. And as this light increases, breathing in and breathing out, imagine that we can connect to each other through the heart, to everyone who's online, to everyone in our communities and everyone throughout the world. And if there's a request or intention that you have for yourself or anyone else, you can imagine that you just place that intention into the light. And 
And this is one of the ways that we come together to bring our loving and our consciousness to bless the world. And now just taking a deep breath and let it go. Take in another deep breath and let it go. And just bring yourself right back here and know that we're really happy to be with you. So Mike, before I ask you a question, would you like to say something to the group? Well, <clears throat> something I'd like to say was interesting was um, when we connected a couple of days ago, I happened to notice, I don't know if it was a, for, for the first time, the little subscript that you have in your emails, which is that wonderful qu quote from, from Rumi, which is there's a voice that doesn't use words, listen, right? Mm -hmm. So I was kind of just bringing that in. And I was thinking um, how perfect it is to have this conversation with you. Because when I think of someone who so lives and connects to inspiration and intuition, it's you, Marianne. So really looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. I'm deeply complimented. Um, just so you know, Mike and I have been friends for so long and have been through so many things together. And I'm so happy to be doing this with you. Mm -hmm. So my question, Mike, is given this time, we can call it a time of transformation. I think it truly is. It can also be called a time of stress and challenge and things that people never expected to experience. From your perspective, why is intuition so important for all of us at this time? Gosh, it's, it's, it's so interesting how much I've gone to my intuition. I, I mean, I think you and I both have lived from a place or practice living from that place consistently, but it particularly feels so relevant given what's been going on over the last eight or nine months. And I'm gonna just reference a model that we speak to a lot and really bring forward in, in, the, uh, in the Insight Seminar, the three selves, the high self, the conscious self and the basic self. And there's, when I think of these times, there's kind of three big thing, three kind of key things that come to mind, Marianne. One is the high self, you know, that aspect of us that provides inspiration, provides insight. As I think of the high self, I think of it as the self that is not bound by time and space. It actually has a freedom to kind of move. And one aspect is many of us are struggling when we try to understand what's the future gonna hold? How do I predict an unpredictable future? And I know you and I both work in corporate clients and they try to use a lot of data and there's a good place to use kind of rational data to do that. And yet when you can't really leverage the past to determine the future, then how do you determine the future? And one of the things I love about the three selves and the high self is the high self seems to have this ability to kind of guide us into the unknown, guide us into a space of saying, trust me, I'll take you forward if we're willing to kind of listen to it. And I think that to me has been one of the most important aspects. As I look to a future that's very hard to predict from the past, the high self kind of comes through. And if I listen to it, it tends to guide me into that space. I think the other thing that the high self does is it provides a sense of perspective. And so it brings in some of the inspiration that we spoke to. It can kind of lift me out of some of the fear and gives me some perspective as as we both know, sometimes the things that look quote unquote bad are actually leading us to something maybe more wonderful. Sometimes we have to go through a breakdown to actually get through a rebirth. And I think the high self can provide some of that perspective. And I think finally, I find myself almost day to day saying, what is real fear? Like, where should I pay attention? You know, I mean, you know that my wife's a doctor. I'm fairly close to some of the action in terms of COVID. And, and so where should I, you know, it, it's not smart to run out without a mask on and be kissing and hugging people right now. So there's like, a, there's something to pay attention there, but also where is the kind of fantasized expectation appearing real? Where's that fear? And how do I make the distinction between those? Because it feels like it's a, it can be a tricky time to kind of, and so again, I, I, I go to the kind of that sense of intuition and kind of ask myself, you know, is this a real fear I should be paying attention to? 
or is this something that I'm making up that I should kind of check out and maybe I could move through? So those were kind of the big areas that I kind of wanted to kind of reference and, uh, and particularly kind of referencing back to the three selves and also how the, how the high self kind of will tend to com communicate back down through the basic self. And so I think I'll kind of wrap your question with noticing oftentimes having to check in my body when I access that intuition as I move through the journey. Anything that you want to add to kind of what I shared? I think I would just for everyone to consider how you access your own intuition and also let you know that there are different types of intuition. So often there's a thing called gut instinct and it really is a real form of intuition, but you feel it physically in your gut. It's like that thing like, don't do this or don't do that or do this or do that. And our inspiration connects through the basic self to us, but it's also very difficult to differentiate. Is this an intuition or is this a fear? Because fear tends to register in the same place often, that kind of, uh-oh, what's happening? So for me, the process of learning about intuition is a lifelong journey of mastery. As Gabriella said, there's just so much here. And one of the biggest keys is self-awareness, which is what we teach in insight. Another form of intuition, and this is very directly connected with insight, is the heart. In insight, we have a heart chart and we call intuition natural knowing. And I'm sure, Mike, you probably experienced this. When you're in the heart, the questions of the mind aren't as relevant. So it's just more natural to do what is necessary. And then looking back, we realize, wow, that was a really good choice. And then the high self, as Mike said, is our guardian. So as we go through the conversation today, I would just like all of you to consider, how do you know your intuition? Do you get a flash, a vision? Do you have a silent voice? Mine is often a very quiet, non-invasive voice. Do you have a gut instinct? Do you have all three? Do you have some other way? Because really each of us has to know exactly what it is for us. I, I, I think my... I love what you said, Marianne, about this being a practice, um, and 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 how do I how do we actually build that? How do I recognize when it was showing up? And maybe just a little build. I have this little interesting, <laughs> my own little way. I have a couple of ways I do, it, but one of the ways I've created is literally uh, a traffic light inside of me. And so when I'm about to do something or take an action, I just say, okay, is it a green light, a yellow light or a red light? I mean, that's just my little technique. <laughs> and if, I, if I get a, I mean, most 95% of the time I get a green light, you know, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, do it. But I'll check in. If I get a yellow, it means uh, pause. You just pause, take a look, you know, and not very often, but rarely I'll get a red. And of course, red means stop. Like, so that just has, it's just over the years, it's been my way very quickly kind of just checking inside to say, you know, am I on course here? Absolutely love it. And you're not the only person that uses that. And it's really a great thing to share. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> you, you had, um, I know you're someone who has been uh, accessing intuition for a long, long time, Marianne. Would you be sh share a little bit about when you first kind of began to think about, recognize, use intuition? Sure. And I want to make a distinction. I want to make a distinction between intuition and inspiration, because for me, they're different. So, and this may not be true for you, just know we're, we're just sharing what's true for us. So for me, inspiration is when I have usually come from what I call the high self. And it's a type of vision of kind of the knowing where I want to go and also feeling the energy of, um, being inspired, that's really the best word I have for it. And that's a very creative process and it's a very beautiful process. My intuition is more for me, moment to moment. Sometimes it's a little bit longer term, but it's more what's needed right here, right now for me, what's the best choice for today. So it's a little more temporal or temporary and it needs to be checked in. When they combine, when the inspiration is taking place and I've got myself connected to my heart and my gut instinct. That's what I call the best of all worlds. So to go back to your question, I started exploring this when I was 17. I was 
in a very traditional university. I was uh, doing all kinds of things that were classic and just exactly how I was, you know, conditioned to do. And I had an experience of what I call the light. And from that moment on, I became fascinated with what is this inner consciousness? What is this aspect of ourselves that doesn't make choices through the mind, doesn't make choices in, in any way that I had been trained to do, but has a way of knowing even the future sometimes or things that I shouldn't be able to know because I didn't have any education for it. So long story short, I've been exploring it for as long since then, and that's a long time, even to the extent of, uh, I spent two years, now this is radical, I spent two years following my intuition, learning about it, and I moved six times in those two years. Now, most people wouldn't take that approach, and I'm not advocating it, but it brings me back to you, Mike, because when you went to Bulgaria, I think it was a very intuitive action for you. How did you know that you wanted to move and create insight in Bulgaria? Well, it, it's, I'm really glad that you framed inspiration and intuition um, and uh, keep the short, it's, it's, it could be a long story, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> I want to hear some of the questions that people are asking in the chat in a moment. But I, um, I had completed my insight. Uh, well, actually, it was in my insight journey. It, it was really insight. It, it so inspired me and it had, had me asking the question, what is the purpose of my heart? Like, what am I here to do? Like, why am I on the planet? You know, so those core questions, why am I here? And, and who am I? And why am I here? And, uh, and in that journey, I got this kind of clarity to kind of go on a bit of a shift in terms of at the time I was working in healthcare as a, as an executive and kind of up and coming. But there were aspects of my life that my life that felt unfulfilled. And so went on a journey that included the insight for um, really uh, had a deep level of inspiration to, to want to go. I, I always had this draw to kind of want to live outside the United States. I, I, I didn't want to go through my, there was something. And for some reason, I've been always pulled to Eastern Europe and Russia. Uh, and when I was younger, that was behind the Iron Curtain. So I know I'm dating myself a little bit. Um, and so I won't share the whole process, but there was something that came forward uh, and I had to go through some process to, you know, to some, some painful process, in fact, to, to make some changes and open some space in my life. But when Bulgaria came forward, and I actually went there as, as a volunteer hospital management consultant, interestingly enough. Uh, but when it showed up, it was like, yes. I mean, there was a yes. I mean, it's a big stretch of my comfort zone, but it was a clear yes that was coming inside of me. And then I'll just take it one step further. Once I arrived in Bulgaria, I had been thinking about I would like to bring Bulgaria, uh, bring insight here. I mean, I had heard the stories about Russia had just opened up and I'm a huge believer in intention. And so uh, the final story I'll share is I, shortly after I arrived in Bulgaria, this is beginning of 1993. So Bulgaria very different than it is now. And I was running up and down the steps of the soccer stadium. And I said, when I finish this run, I'm gonna make a decision. I'm gonna make a commitment whether I'm gonna go for creating an insight seminar here, an insight one here or not. And again, as I was running, and there's something else that happens for me, a lot of intuition shows up when I'm moving. I notice when my body moves mm -hmm. a lot, like that's another aspect. And so it just kind of came, it was kind of like, well, you said you're gonna live on purpose. What's the most purposeful thing you can do while you're in Bulgaria? And it was a very clear answer. It's like, you can bring insight here. So. It's, it's gorgeous. And I'm so glad you brought up the thing about moving. Um, also, intuition can show up in the shower. It can show up all kinds of places. So it's something you want to attend to. So are you okay, Mike, with us taking a question or two from the chat? I'd love to I hear some questions. Love to do that. So Gabriella, you choose. <laughs> Great. So there's a really good one. And I love what you guys are saying about all the different distinctions, you know, between intuition and inspiration. This is a really good one um, that I think a lot of people can relate to, which is my intuition seems to come through my mind, which makes it challenging to discern thoughts from intuition. So anything you have to say on that? So, it keeps coming to me, Mike, to talk a little bit about the sanctuary, which is one of the most powerful tools we have in insight. Well, it's not the most powerful. We have so many powerful tools, but it's one of 
my favorite tools in terms of accessing intuition and inspiration. So in the Insight Seminar, we help people to create a space that is their private sanctuary. And in that space, you can also invite a master teacher to come to you. So this can be done by anyone, anywhere. We just ask that you ask for the highest good for yourself or anyone else. And the reason I'm bringing that up is because there is a part of our consciousness that is above the mind. And maybe it shouldn't be linear or spatial like that, but it's different than the mind. And if you can learn to calm down, go to the quiet place inside, move to the center of your heart, find a way to get out of the chatter. And I think that's one of the reasons that Mike's suggestion of moving is so important because it disperses the chatter. Then there is a still place that has an intuitive factor very high, experientially high energetic with it. That's not to say that it doesn't come through the mind. I want to make that sure. When I do a lot of, I do a lot of design work. And when I do design work, my mind is really a useful tool. But the inspiration comes from a different place. And then I put my thoughts to it. And there's a great discipline in being clear on my thought process. That's what I've got, Mike. Why don't you add? I, my only add, I mean, I, th I thought it was beautiful, Marianne, and uh, um, my, my one add is there's also a very tactical, practical way you can work with that, which is check it out. Mm -hmm. And what I mean, one of the ways that I practice my intuition is if a little thought and like, don't check it out, like, you know, make a big life change on it, I, but practice with little ways. So I sometimes get a, I'll be, when I, when we were traveling a lot, and now Marianne and I were on airplanes a lot. You know, I tend to sit in my seat and kind of get inside myself. And but every once in a while, I'll get a thing like say, say hello to that person. <laughs> that's, it's not a big deal, but it's a little bit out of my comfort zone sometimes. But it's like, oh, OK, let me say hello. Right. And what I notice is if something shows up for me, can I take an, a small action with it? Can I take a small action with it? Because it does two things. It kind of checks out a little bit and sees, is this something that feels like real intuition? I mean, it's just and it also lets the intuition know I'm listening. And so that muscle of the intuition says, oh, you're listening, you did something with that. So I find it quite important that it's communicating to a part of me that I'm listening. And it's also a way for me to kind of check out some of that, what can sometimes be chatter to kind of find out really what is the intuitive message. And if I could add just one more thing, then we'll take another question. For me, when my intuition comes through the mind, there's no demand on it it's neutral. It's a, I would call it because I'm mostly auditory, I would call it a whisper. It's like, you might do this, like Michael's example, you might say hello to this person. There's nothing like, go do this. You should say hello to this person. So if the question is also about how you differentiate the different types of thoughts, one key for me is that there's a stillness with it. There's a gentleness with it. There's a lack of demand. It's like, if you want, you could try this. Um, whereas when my mind is going, when it's more my mind, there's usually a, a, a lot of demand, a lot of anxiety, a lot of uh, push is what I would call it. Okay, how about another question? That was fantastic. Another one uh, is how do we not allow or let depression or perhaps feelings of sadness or depression uh, that blocks our intuition or shuts us down? How do we not let it do that? Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> it's really, um, I'm really glad you brought it forward. Um, and, and I just want to acknowledge that uh, those of us that are particularly sensitive, I want to bring in a little bit of compassion here. Uh, those of us that are particularly sensitive, which many of you are, uh, can sometimes have that compassion and sensitivity move into a space that can maybe move into some depression or some things that get in your way. Uh, I, I noticed that with me, now I have a, I would invite you all to, if you don't have something, to have some kind of a daily practice. Uh, and one of the ways that I work with when I kind of pick up energy where 
I don't know if I'd say I get deeply depressed, but I can get into self-doubt. I can move into some anxiety. I can move into some spaces. I can feel overwhelmed. Is I have a daily practice that I do almost every morning. It can come by different names. Some people can call it meditation, spiritual exercises. I call mine my inner work. And it's my way to kind of lift myself. It's a, it's a practice I use to work to lift myself and Marianne kind of brought us in with a little bit of a, of, of a visualization where I, I lift myself kind of in the light in a way that can lift me a, a, above some of that self-talk, the chatter, uh, anxiety, the concern, the, the overwhelm that can show up in a way that can kind of lift me so that I can then have greater access to that intuition. Because I think there is something that we can begin to block it when we move into some spaces where we disconnect because as Marion has spoken to that intuitive or inspirational aspect comes from an aspect of ourself that it does sit, take some tuning in to really listen to. Uh, and so, I mean, the way that I kind of practice is that I kind of hold to a something that consistently kind of lifts me back into a place where I can hear again. Marion, your, your builds. Uh, I love what you said, Mike, just a couple things. Um, even in corporations now, uh, you, some of you were on the call with Joey and Peter last week, um, meditation is now recognized as a fundamental best practice of leadership. Uh, it used to be, uh, Ariana called it bringing uh, the CEOs out of the closet because uh, there was a time when no CEO would talk about their meditation practice. Now people are, are discussing it quite a lot. So there are as many forms of meditation as there are of intuition. That said, as, as Mike was suggesting, you can only go so far in terms of understanding your consciousness, your heart, other people through the mind, the body, and the emotions. Because there is a different place inside of ourselves that we can access. And when we access that, then there's a sense of being aligned with yourself being present in your life, being attuned. There's lots of different words that we can use to describe this, but you'll have to discover it for yourselves. But the quieting oneself down, the coming into a presence inside that is different than our mental chatter, all of our emotional feelings, our physical sensations, that is one of the most powerful tools of practice if you want to develop your intuition and your inspiration. I think that's all I have to say on that. Maybe one little build and then mm -hmm. another question. Uh, you know, when we do insight, we do it. I mean, while Mary and I both do some one-to-one -one coaching, I think more of the work we do tends to be facilitation. And one of the things I love about facilitating is that there's multiple people there. We're doing it together. We're in connection with other people. So the other thing that shows up for me is then when we move into a place where it's anxiety or depression or something, is how do we remember that we're not alone? How do we remember, you know, Marianne started this with a visualization that when we connect through our heart, we connect with everyone and everything. There's a place of connection and that the great illusion is separation. The great illusion in life is separation. So how can we, if we go to that place, how can we remember that we're not alone and even if it just means reaching out to a friend, reaching out to someone you know in the insight community, oftentimes that connection can be a way that can lift us if we're, struggle, if we're struggling to actually lift ourselves. Mm -hmm. So just one bit of information for those of you who may not have this. So insight has always been about the heart. And, and I think both Michael and I, although we study and teach other things, many other things, I think it's one of our deepest foundations. And in that foundation, we've always taught that the heart is the place that you can go to to connect. So it's not the physical heart. It's what you would call the heart center, the part of us that knows. And um, if you listen to language across the planet, you'll hear, in, regardless of the country, you'll hear people say, trust your heart, listen to your heart, follow your heart. Because as human beings, we just somehow know that that's a place we can access and also move out of our depression, move out of our sadness, move out of our despair. Recently, a, com a, a company, a research institute called HeartMath has proven 
that the heart center actually has an energetic of connection. It can be measured. So one practice is very similar to what I did in the beginning is to take five minutes. We use the visualization of the white light because for us, it represents the universal consciousness. The so we've got so the heart. So bringing the light into your heart, bringing compassion into your heart, forgiving any judgments you've made about whatever you're experiencing, and then taking a few moments to just breathe in and breathe out with love. You can breathe in love and breathe out love is a very powerful tool that you can use. Now in my life, I've experienced really deep depression. So there's lots of different tools that, you know, are need to access all of that. But one of the most important is compassion, self-compassion. And then to know that if you can learn and practice to bring yourself back to the heart in the present, we usually don't have these problems. It's usually when we're fantasizing about the future or the past. That's what I've got. I mean, we can... Let's take one more question, Gabrielle, and then we'll see if we have others to ask each other. <laughs> um, so this is a great one. Uh, how can one sustain inspiration as fuel and content when the focus of the inspiration is an action or an outcome that will take sustained focus or many steps? Can I take a first stab at that? Go right. for it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> It's the, the first word that came up for me when you spoke about that is intention. Uh, and that, you know, we talk about the purpose of our hearts and then our purpose of our hearts come into the world. Like, so, you know, and so then it means, what is it, what does it mean to manifest that? What does it mean? How does that, it, you know, and how does that express into the world? And, you know, there's so many aspects of the, of, of insight that kind of come to mind, like, even when we look at uh, symbols and experiences and how do we have the inner experience and, and the outer outcome. But when I think about being in action um, and focused on an outcome and our inspiration has spoke to us, like it did for me to go to Bulgaria and bring insight there or a whole number of other things that we could use. When that, that intention or that purpose comes from our heart and is guided by the high self, and we have that intuition. To me, there is a, a it, it's it's a wonderful partnership, and so constantly checking in, because I, I believe we demonstrate deep belief in our intention, in our heart's purpose, when we're in action consistent with it. Because effectively, if I'm not in action around. That, in, that inspiration, intuition, there's some part of me that doesn't believe it. And I know sometimes some of the people who do our work, it's kind of like, it's almost like it, it doesn't get fully grounded into the body. And I think when we're taking action consistent with an intention that is aligned with our heart purpose, that's actually a communication back to our intuition that we're listening. And I think it actually creates more energy for an even greater clarity about where we're going and why we're going there. Marianne? Well, I love what you said. And John Roger, our founder of Insight, always encouraged action because we can sit for a long, long time in our minds with an idea and do nothing and nothing happens. <laughs> so it's really important to move on it and to follow and to change your course if you need to change your course. Um, there's a thing in, in the Insight One about feedback, and feedback is literally a message from our world, letting us know if we're on course or if we're off course. That said, I want to take a slightly different track here, because if an outcome is over a long period of time, there can be moments when it can feel like, what happened to my inspiration? What happened to my intuition? I'm just in nowhere territory. So one of the things that we've learned in the last couple of years working with the master's class is that downtime is really important for creativity. And it's often a time when you don't have any awareness of what you're gonna do next. You don't know what's coming and it can feel very uncomfortable because you wanna get it done. In my own life, um, I have found, this is a tool I've used since I was a little girl, my mother gave it to me. 
when I have a timeline, let's say the timeline is with, with the master's class, I had took me about nine months to design it. So there was a long, long timeline. And what I would do is I would put whatever my idea was about it in what I call the hopper. Now the hopper is a Midwest term. It's a grain silo. But the thing about a hopper is that it drops down at the perfect time. So when you need the grain, it comes at the perfect time. And that's kind of how my mother taught it to me. So she would say as a little girl, she said, if you don't know the answer, put it in the hopper and trust that it will come down at a perfect time. So over the years, I've given myself the freedom to place an idea and not have the answer into what I call the hopper. I actually call it the spear, but it started as the hopper. And then to also give my basic self a timeline. Like, yeah, we've got maybe a couple of weeks here, but by this date, I need to have something. And then do the discipline of sitting down at the computer when I get that little inner voice, like the time is now, even if it's only a paragraph, sit down now. Now, I know that's very counterintuitive to what people who write will tell you. People who write will tell you, most of them will say, it's a daily discipline. You must write every day, whether you know what you're gonna receive is what you want or not. So I, I want you to have all the options here. So if you're doing, you wanna be a writer, it could be that you need to do it every day so that you can get it done. Um, yeah, that's what I've got. When I have one little build and it's gonna be something I think I originally heard from you, Marianne, um, which is when we set an intention and that intention has a specific outcome to it. And this connects back to how Marianne began our journey in this conversation is can we wrap that in the statement that uh, this or something better for the highest good of all concerned? Mm -hmm. Because then it kind of creates the space that as we move to it, if in fact our sense of purpose uh, elevates um, or there's something even more available to us there, um, it can speak to us. I think the other thing I'll just share that's showing up for me is like, and this is showing up, I mentioned this in, in this kind of pandemic period, is I don't always recognize on the mental level what's going to best take me where I need to go. Um, and the, the, the part of me mentally that says, oh, it's a straight line. If I want to go from here to here, it's going to be a straight line journey. And, and some of you have done some of the work where we, we look at the goal line versus the learning line. And it's like, the journey, even though we set a journey to have this outcome, I'm going to have this new car, I'm going to develop this new program, or I'm going to have what we're oftentimes really up to is who do I need to become to become a match for that outcome? And so what's the journey I go on that my heart and my high self is actually taking me on so that I can be evolving and learning and growing in the process? so that I can become the person that's a match for that goal and ultimately a match for the kind of sense of purpose I'm holding in my heart. So there's just two things that I wanna add here. One is uh, Mike was talking about intention and we create according to our intention, but also our focus of attention. And the focus of attention actually drives our choices. So for example, if you have an outcome where you want more money and you're focusing on the lack of money in your bank account, the lack of money focus, not the fact that you don't have money, the lack of money focus is going to direct you to see more of that and to experience more of that and to feel even poorer than before you started the positive intention. So why is that important? Because when you're working with your intuition and inspiration, there's a certain level of commitment or trust that's required. So Mike and I have both shared that we've been practicing and it, I really mean it as a practice, often day-to-day, -day, moment to moment practice to learn what's my intuition, what's my fear, what's my intention, am I caught in some kind of uh, preconditioned idea of how all this should be happening? All those things are part of self-awareness. And with self-awareness comes the opportunity to move into the natural knowing, the part of us that actually does know what's going to be bad for us, but it also takes courage and commitment. So very briefly, when I first did my Insight 2, I was working in uh, early childhood education. 
my boss had told me, you can go do that, but you must promise me you will not do any more of this this year. I need you here. And of course, before I did the seminar, I said, yes. On the way back, I realized I needed to go to the next Insight 2 as an assistant. It was, and I'm a commitment person. So this was like completely against my values to even consider breaking a commitment with my boss. And what happened was I made a commitment to the level where I was willing to get fired. So when I went to have the conversation with her, I said, look, I know I promised you and I'm not a person that breaks my promise. But as far as I can tell, for the good of me and the good of these children, I need to go and be at this event next week and I'm willing to have you fire me to do it. Very long story short, she had actually seen one of my interactions with one of the most difficult little kids, a little two-year-old. And I didn't know she'd seen it. And she said, I saw what you did with Eliza. Absolutely, you can go. So there's, there's different aspects, you know, as Gabriella started by saying, there's so much here and there is so much, but I don't want to eliminate the idea that we really, but we also need to watch what we're attending to. So Mike, I'm kind of interested in their questions. I don't have any other ones I need to ask you. What about you? I would definitely like to hear if there's more out there. I'm sure there are. Okay. Thank you guys so much. All of what you're saying is so valuable to me personally, of course, and I'm sure everyone else here. So thank you. And um, another question that I think is very relevant is, do you try to lift above grief from the loss of something you love or let yourself navigate through the grief first before allowing the inspiration, the intuition? I'll, I'll take a tack on that one. So grief is an emotion that has an unusual aspect to it. Some of us are just emotionally based. A lot of my life, I was emotionally based. And so my feelings would be exaggerated often. Many of you probably have that. It wouldn't be just sad. It was terribly sad. It wasn't just depressed. It was horribly depressed, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I had to learn how to move out of that through some of the techniques we've been talking to you about. Grief though, from everything that I've read, understood, all the research that has been done is unfortunately or fortunately a necessary human experience when we lose someone. And it has stages. And the first stage is denial. And then there's a stage of anger and then there's a stage of depression and then there's a stage of acceptance. And I may not have run them exactly right. I haven't thought about it for a while, but it, that's the basic idea. So the first thing is to give yourself permission to grieve, to face the fact that you've lost something dear and important to you, and also to get support. However, support, this is one, one thing for, for everybody to know, when you're trying to support someone who's grieving, one of the worst things you can say is, I understand how you feel. Because the person will just go, no, you don't. You don't know what this means to me. But if you will be with them and let them know that you're there for them, and if they need anything from you, that's really powerful. Then as you go through the stages, self-awareness, like, am I accepting this? Am I angry because of this? Whatever it is. And then you can learn to teach yourself to move back into your heart, even while you're having those emotions. So for me, when I do this, I go straight to my basic self, which is usually in the abdominal area. And it's the part that has a lot of trouble with these kinds of feelings. And I comfort myself. I place my hands over my abdomen and I let myself know it's like the little Marianne. Marianne, I'm here for you. If you need to cry all day, it's okay. Because I'm here for you. And I know there's another place inside of us that exists, but right now you're crying and that's okay. That, that would be my answer. Mike, any ads? Just a short ad. First of all, I love your referencing how our ability to parent ourselves, uh, particularly in grieving times, uh, uh, we can be the parent to ourselves that maybe we didn't have. Uh, I just share, as you know, Marianne, and some of you know, and we, we had a great loss in our insight community and a, a very dear mm -hmm. friend of mine that, that died suddenly a little over a month ago. And I just want to reinforce, because I've been supporting his family, um, his wife and his family. And just a reinforcement of what you said, which is 
mostly I just drop a text or a call and I say, thinking of you today, you're in my heart. Um, mm -hmm. And don't really go a whole lot beyond that. It's just the awareness that letting them know that they're in my heart and, and in my thoughts, which I feel like then they, they do whatever they do with it, as opposed to, like you said, that, that and there's, you know, uh, you know the, the phrases people use oftentimes, which oftentimes actually are, are counterproductive. Go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 please. So I just want to add one thing, because this is a possibility. It's a reality. It's something to have fun with. Your intuition can also connect to others who are in need, as Mike is saying. Um, and we have a community, a global community. And I cannot tell you how many times someone just gets inside. They, that's the language. I got, to, I got to email you. I got it inside to call you. And it's so often exactly what I needed. And I do the same for people. If suddenly I kind of get that little voice inside that says, you know, call Mike, call Gabriella, say hello. It becomes a very powerful um, proof of our connection, not only with ourselves, but with each other. And I think we've been implying it here. From our point of view, that's a universal connection available to all of us as humans. And it's quite powerful to exercise it. So Mike, I've got a question for you because it just popped in. So <laughs> you're away. a parent. Yes. You're a parent. You're a dad. Maria's the mom, who's from Bulgaria, by the way. That's part of their story. And you have two beautiful girls. So when your girls are having difficulty, how do you access your intuition? Because I imagine it's a little bit different. Well, a couple of things. <laughs> one, I, first of all, I think one of my big roles in relationship with those people that are closest to me, or actually any relationship when I have enough awareness to remember it, and I'm not always aware, believe me, um, is how can I help them to be the best, the best version of themselves? So I'm kind of holding that as a context, like how can I be in a relationship with them that they can be the best version of themselves? I will say that um, I am always checking about when's the right time to say something. <laughs> I mean, I laugh, but like there are times where it's like, this is not the right time to bring this up. And, and uh, it's quite interesting that, uh, you know, we have a commitment to honesty and my awareness is like, is this the right time to actually speak to something. And that's a tricky one. That's another area. It's interesting. Sometimes we think of intuition as something that gives us these big, huge moments or big changes in life when you and I have spoken about. It's, it's a daily, it's not just a daily practice to use it at some point. It's a daily thing to use. And I feel like in relationship, it's one of the most important things. And I have to really, you talked about coming back into the heart, you know, in the middle of the heart chart is I am experiencing self-awareness now. And so one of those elements of awareness, and maybe the biggest one is, am I, am I connected into that inner voice that you're speaking to? And in relationship with them, one, is this the right time? And two, particularly if there's some of this, which will happen in any relationship, it's like, where am, where's my intention coming from here? Am I wanting the best for this? Or am I in that right wrong space am i wanting you know am i placed do i want to make my voice heard here because i feel like i'm right about something and relationship like is what what a teaching ground for life right i mean it, whether you're, you're married or not or have kids or not or whatever to me it's one of the richest places for using intuition and inspiration um, and really noticing for me one is this the right time and Am I coming from the intention? You know, we've talked about feed when we talk, you talk a little bit about feedback when we give feedback in the insight one. It's like, where is that, where's that coming from inside of me? So those are the two big things that I check for when I'm in communication and also checking internally in relationship to my wife and, and my kids. Thank you. It's it's just a great, great answer. And the reason I asked it is because when we're invested in a relationship, it can be even more challenging. So I think you just addressed that beautifully. Um, and I, if I just summarize some of the things that we've been saying throughout the call, I want to make it explicit, is it seems like much of what we've learned, because we're exploring that together, much of what we learned is about moving to an inner place that doesn't have all the distortion and disturbance that we often have in our emotions and our mind. So 
again, with we mentioned in Insight, there's lots and lots of beautiful tools for that. But we're also recommending a kind of daily practice or moment to moment practice of checking in with yourself and finding out where am I coming from right now? Is this my need or is it really for the highest good? Um, that's how I would summarize that. Um, Gabrielle, I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, you can lead us, guide us here, but. Great. So here's one. Um, often I wake up in the middle of the night with words floating in the air and beautiful images too. When I don't write the words down or what the images are about, they're gone. When I write the words down, they're usually a beautiful poem and the images usually become a painting. Are those experiences inspiration or intuition or both? Wow. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to define that except that how wonderful. And you're bringing up something that we didn't mention, which is the dream state which similar to what you said about intuition, and inspiration, Gabriela, it's there's so much in the dream state. Um, so if you, if you take the commitment to your own self to start to learn about, there are so many possibilities that can open to you, poetry, painting, healing. It can even predict your future, all kinds of things. So the dream state is another level of intuition, inspiration, connection that is profound. I, I won't speak more about dreams because I really feel like you're someone, Marianne, who so connects with and, and utilizes that unconscious space. I do know that it can be very valuable um, to take some of your, your questions into your, into your sleep and ask for some guidance from that 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 unconscious higher conscious you know whatever that happens in that sleep space and and what i loved about what you shared is i noticed that it, there's another practice here which is can i capture what shows up because i notice sometimes i will and sometimes i'll be like oh, yeah, it's like i want to just roll back over or once i come fully awake i won't remember what was there so there's some another part of this muscle that says i'm listening and so let me do something with it when I come out of that, come out of that dream state, um, which I, um, well, it's interesting. I really appreciate bringing up the question because it's actually one I think I can work a bit more myself. And there, there's something in the, the, the question, which is really important, which is ask. Mm -hmm. So in the Bible, there's something that says, ask and you shall receive. So there is an aspect of intuition that requires us to ask. Ask the higher self, ask the universe, ask your heart, but it opens us. It lets us open the field so that we can receive more. And when you practice that, it can become quite profound. So Mike said earlier, you're not alone. You really aren't. And any moment of any day, of any second, you can ask for help. It's just like, help, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I need something here. And then be willing to let that be received in its own timing. Um, fabulous question, so glad you brought it up. I also wanna just quickly, I love how you mentioned it shows up as a poem or a painting. Mm -hmm. And I know that again, Mary and I work outside of insight. I know the work I do sometimes is how to help corporate people activate what we sometimes call the, the right brain or the intuitive brain. And so really also paying it, if you wanna also help activate some more of that intuition, do some of those things that are maybe connect to nature a little bit more, do a little bit of, you know, do some drawing, poetry, you know, music, you know, movement, a whole series of things that can activate what sometimes referenced as a more creative part of us, but also can activate more of that intuition. So Gabrielle, I know we're just about five minutes before we end, and I don't know how much time we need to spend with letting people know about events. So guide me here. Thank you guys so much. And you too, I just wanna say work so beautifully together. And I think that you have just done a wonderful job sharing about yourselves and also answering everyone's questions. And so thank you. And there is one more question that I think would be lovely um, to just go over. And that's 
if at times the outcome of a choice is not clear and it's perceived as a risk, how can I reassure myself that it's okay, really okay? <laughs> Go ahead, Mike. I, I don't know. I, I, what I love is you actually finished with almost like an affirmation when you asked <laughs> the question or the way the question was asked. And it's, it's some part of this greater trusting that Marianne was speaking to. And I'm going to keep this brief, but it's like trusting like there's something greater than simply the outcomes I create. There's something greater that's holding me um, and holding us. And I, I know that I have referenced back to that over and over again, certainly before this, the, the whole COVID thing, but certainly I've had mornings where I've woken up and it's been, you know, Russell Bishop, one of the uh, co-creators of Insight, said, open up one more time than you close down. And I still love that. And so there's a part of me that's like, and, and it's a core, it's like a belief that I work, which is love is greater than fear. It is okay. And in the end, whatever we call the end to be, you know, it's all going to work out. And so I know I actually reinforce that inside of me as a go-to belief. Marianne? The only thing I would add is timing. So a lot of us have clear intentions and we have an idea of when it should show up. And we're really clear about that. And when it doesn't show up, we can tend to give up our intention or get discouraged or whatever. So I would advocate that you continually check in to see if this is still your intention. Because sometimes it takes a lot longer than you would think. But if it isn't, it can change. So be, be relaxed with yourself. It's like, wow, six months ago, I thought I absolutely needed this. It isn't here. And actually, I'm interested in something else now with that. But if it's still your intention, then check. Are you doing everything possible? You could do, most of us stop doing. And if you're still doing that, keep the focus and keep going. You, it, it, these things have a way of showing up at unexpected times. That, that's it. Thank you. Thank you both. Awesome. Well, I think that we can go ahead and go into promo. So. Before we do, I just want to thank everyone on the call. It's been so wonderful to answer your questions and be with all of you. I can feel you. It's wonderful. I'll just echo Marianne's word. It's really, I have to tell you, it's a privilege for me to be able to um, share the space with Marianne and also share it with all of you. Um, so thank you and blessings. Yeah. Okay. So do you want to talk about these events, Gabriella? Sure. Or did you want to do it? I, we can... Either way, uh, Roger, if you're here, or Irene, if you're here to put them up, the slides. Awesome. OK, so I'll talk about this one. Great. This is going to be fabulous. This is Leslie and Ruth, two incredibly powerful, beautiful, gorgeous women, and deep, deep friends of mine. And they're going to have a conversation with each other, similar to what Mike and I did and Peter and Joey did. And both of them have tremendous experience in this area of self-care as an increase, an ability to increase your self-awareness and be really in the place of well-being in your life. So that's same Wednesday, December 16th, 10 to 11. Next, what do you have up next? Maybe I'll talk briefly about this and maybe you can mm -hmm. build Gabriella if you would like to. Uh, this is Insight Ignite and this is actually open to everybody. And it, it's, it, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, Gabriella, but my understanding it's, it's an opportunity for people to get a, a taste of Insight even before the Insight one, but it's also open to Insight uh, graduates as well. It's a seminar, two part seminar and it's really designed to kind of connect, help people connect into that kind of sense of the purpose of their heart. And then also how to really leverage intention in terms of bringing that forward in their life. Uh, that's January 16th and the 23rd, uh, open to all. And uh, again, pricing is a $200. Uh, yeah, uh, anything you wanna build on that, Gabriella, that I didn't, that I didn't uh, cover? That's fantastic, yep. And I think we have one more, right? Yep. I'll let Marianne speak to this. So this is the Insight 2. 
and it's going to be done on Zoom. I've been speaking with Rachel Jane quite a lot over the last few months because we've been virtually facilitating the master's class in Bulgaria. And what she has shared with me is that although the Insight 2 is often an in-person seminar, that across the world now we're finding ways to have the deep connections take place virtually until we get out of COVID. So for any of you who have uh, Insight 2, I would encourage you to get in. I don't know, I imagine it's limited to a certain number of people. I don't see that on the sign, but you can always call the office and ask. So Gabrielle, anything you'd add to that one? Yeah, that's perfect. And I would just say, you know, if this is maybe your first time doing an online workshop with Insight, welcome and thank you so much for joining. And if it's not, even if it is, you know, you can feel it. You can feel the connection. You can feel the depth. It really, it works. It works is what I'll say. And so all of these offerings, you know, whatever applies, whatever feels aligned for you, I would say go for it because it's needed now more than ever. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you, Marianne. And thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Roger and Gabriella. Yeah, thank you, Roger. Thank you, guys. Translators, Pecha and Alicia. So God bless you all. Namaste. Have a beautiful day. Take good care. Bye. Bye.